Mel, my name is Lawrence. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. You know why you're here? Uh, yes. You know why you're here. Yes. You have your head done, portrait for a sculpture in, to, be, to be set up in or placed in Doncaster somewhere, mining. And you're here really to talk about your the life, place. please, while we do your head. My life in mining. Your life in mining, your life right. after mining and before mining and everything. Right, before really. mining. Yeah, right. family. Family but and... I was brought up in a mining village. Really? Where's that? Stainforth. Ah, so you're at Hatfield. Yes, it was at Hatfield Colliery. I was at Rosington for three years before that, right. from 1970 to 73. And then uh, I couldn't get a job at Hatfield at that time, and the, the pit was over the field from where I lived. Oh, no. But I couldn't get a job there, so I went to Rosington. I worked for three years there on haulage. Then I came back to Hatfield when they accepted me, when there was a vacancy. Yeah. I went on the haulage there, and it was a totally different pit to Rosington. It was smelly and horrible oh, really? and wet. So they quite they they changed in personality quite a lot. These. Oh yeah, every pit's got its own personality. So Rosington was what dry and dry, hot because they were in the Barnsley scene. Right. And the Barnsley bed was really really hot because they cut the ventilation down to stop the spontaneous combustion. Yes, we're talking about this. Yeah. Yeah yeah yeah. So they cut the ventilation down so it's always hot. So yeah. I came from a hot pit into Hatfield, which was a cool pit. Right. And uh, if you worked in the headings, you know, these are drivages, it was always hot in there because you relied on fans ventilating. Right. But on the coal faces, it wasn't too bad. Because in the hazel where I worked, it was about 36 to 60 inches. So the hazel is a seam. Seam of coal, yeah. Right, they call it the hazel. We were told it was the best coal in the country. I think every miner's had the best coal in yeah, the country. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's Queen's, no, it wasn't Queen's coal, was it? That's Bentley. No, it was Hatfield. Hatfield was Queen's yeah, Coal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Every miner will tell you that, that the Queen's Coal came from yes. their pit. <laughs> but I know officially, you know officially that it came from Hatfield. Right. High hazel coal was the best quality. Was it? Yes. Very sought after. That's why Hatfield pit was still open when all the rest were closed. Oh. Because of the quality of the coal. And is that because of the stone it's found in? See, how does it, is its depth for? I don't know really, I have no idea. All I know is that it was very, very good coal, but they had to, it was so good, it burnt so hot that they had to combine it with Barnsley bed coal. Right. So that it burnt at a certain rate. Right. So they had to mix it up. For the coal, for the power stations, yeah. Gosh. So anyway, so you got your job in, Hat, you went to Hatfield after Rosington, but Hatfield yeah, was Yeah, that was smelly. in 1973. Christ. And, uh, I worked on the coal face from 1975 till 1980, and then I went on staff. All right. Then Prior to that, I did a degree in, in, in politics and economics at Sheffield University. Hell. But that was paid for by the union, by the NUM. So this was, you were, so you were a minor, yes. and they, they paid you to be re-educated? Yes. Because you were leaving? Indoctrinated, you... can I just say, it was indoctrination. Oh, I didn't realise at the time, but I do now into, what we, are we saying, into well, the left-wing left politics? Yeah, yeah. It, they wanted me to be a Corbynista, because that's what Corbyn is, you know, he's a left-winger. Yeah. And we were left-wingers then, and it was great then. Yeah. We needed left-wingers then, but we don't need them now. Right. We don't need them now. And I've voted Labour all my life, yeah. and I've got no one to vote for now. Gosh. And I'm really, really fed up about that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But what can you do? Wait. Wait, exactly. <laughs> I think there'll be momentous, big changes. Momentous really. changes. There must, must be round the yeah, corner soon. There will be. Definitely. Go on. Definitely. Blimey. So then in 1980, I had to make a decision whether to go um, into politics. Right. Which most of my friends did that went on the course at Sheffield. Or on the staff. What do you mean by on the staff? Well, to become an official of the mine. Right. So and white, um, collar, white collar. Well, no, we were on the job. Right. On the job. But, uh, yeah, Colliery Deputy. A deputy, right, gotcha. Which, uh, which I actually... Keep forward when I go around your side. So I did accept that. I, um, I went on staff. Okay. And I, I remember telling my mates, I said to them, I said, look, I said, I know most of you are going into politics. Some went on to become MPs, some became really? leaders of councils. One of my friends became leader of Doncaster Council. Good Lord. Yeah, and I could have followed that, but I didn't. I went on to become a Colliery... Um, official. So is this because you loved mining? Had a passion for yeah, it? Yeah, I did, yeah, I did. And I still have. Right. If, if I had my time again. 
I bet they all say that. Well, yeah, the ones that come here. <laughs> I bet the ones they all that don't come that. here never want to go back in it again. No, exactly. I, I talk to friends now and they don't want to know, you know. Yeah. I said to a guy the other day, I said, can you remember when we worked on 70s, Brian? He said, 70s? Where was that then? I said, you worked on there for four years. He said, no. He said, all I did was get off the chair, get on the paddy and go where I was told. That was it. Yeah. But I loved mining, yeah. Loved it. And I'd still do it again now. Good. And you love mining because? I don't know. I think a lot of people say it's the camaraderie. Yeah. yeah, to a certain extent. Yeah, there was that. But it was the job itself. It was a challenge every single day. It was a, what I call a proper job. Yeah. You didn't know what to expect from one day to the next. Like I say, it changed. The seam could behave itself one day and the next day it was in. Really? And uh, you could guarantee that you, you went into the control room, you'd phone your colleague on the face on day shift, let's say it was an afternoon shift, pick the phone up, you get to know what was happening. And you could guarantee it at Hatfield because the seed there was very friable, that the roof had come in at a certain point during, you know, along the face. So the first thing I used to do is direct men towards the fall, get them to shore it all up, timber it up, as we used to call it. Mm -hmm and then continue cutting coal. But yeah. So how long was that? I, um, you talk about after a, a ceiling fall? A, fall, a, a roof fall, a yeah. Roof fall. yeah. I mean, how common was that? Oh, very common at Hatfield, yeah. Really? Yeah, all the time. Are you talking about stuff in the gob? No, no, you no, you talk about on the face side. Really? Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was common at Hatfield. It was terrible. The roof conditions at Hatfield were absolutely awful. Is that because the coal was high quality? No, this is the stone falling then, isn't it? It's, it's the stone the above, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think, no, it was with the equipment we were using, I think. What, what do you mean, sending shot waves up through there? No, uh, what happens is that if you don't support the roof initially, straight away, you know, you, you cut the coal out and then you support it straight away. Yeah. If you don't support it straight away, or if you support it and the roof isn't supported properly, yeah. then it'll come in. And so and you're if, saying your props and chocks weren't the right design for the job? Yeah, they were old chocks. I remember going on to 71s. Oh, what a face that was. The very first face I ever worked on. So what is numbers? What's the 70? They're just name, uh, numbers regarding the units that you worked on. I worked in the northeast of the pit, which was five miles from the pit bottom. Jesus. And it was very hot in there. Five miles? The yeah, five, five miles. Five miles? And we used to go down a one in 16 drift to get there. And, and, the and, diesel. That one, and that one to get back. Twelve coaches on it, with like 20 men in each coach. Good God. And it used to get away a few times. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. And then there was an incident at Bentley Pit, and a friend of mine was killed there on that incident. Which what incident was that? It was when the paddy got away. On, a, on an incline, a one in 16 like we had at Hatfield. And uh, the driver didn't get the diesel in control, and it... It just came off the road and crashed and killed a dozen men. A dozen men? <coughs> yeah. Yeah. And an old mate of mine that was in the mines rescue with me called Don Box, he was killed there. Yeah. Fun enough. Yeah, we had one. Yeah. I was going to say it might not be the same one, but there was a guy first, yesterday, the guy. Um, just a slight, uh, your, your paddy wagons have your, your, your arms on them to keep the stuff in, is that right? And he went through a door and it caught in the door, yeah, yeah. twisted around and killed this guy. Yeah. The sides of the paddy, yeah. Yeah, the sides of the paddy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I was in the mines rescue for oh, 12 years, I think. So let's just get through. So you were, how long were you out, were working at the coal face in Hatfield before you went off to do your retraining? Before I went to... You went off to, so you, do, you, work, you worked in the coal face, did you, for the first I worked on the coal face as a workman from 74 right. or 75 to 1980. And then I went on staff right. and I retrained at Doncaster so College. when did you go to Sheffield? Oh, that was in 77 till 1980. Right. Okay, so you had, was that part-time kind of course then? Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Every week. Used to go two days a week, Thursday, Friday. Yeah. Quite exciting times. 
It was. It was very exciting because, like I say, most of the guys that I went to college with went on to become MPs or So who are they now? These local local dignitaries. But are there any MPs we know? Uh, no. Reese Mogg? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, they've all gone now, really? I'm afraid. Yeah, they've all retired and moved on. Really? Yeah. Already? How old yeah. are you? 65. Oh, you're really? Mm. Good luck. You're a very good man. So they've gone, you know. Yeah. Moved Who on were they? Retired. Who were they? Right. I don't know whether you, you don't know much about Doncaster Gate. Yes, I do. You do? Well, not much, but I know it happened. Donny Gate. I know it happened. Well, I was at university at the time, and I got a phone call while I was at uni from an old friend of mine. He was leader of Doncaster Council at the time. And he, he informed me about it. He told me all about it. He said, Mel, you're down there. You don't know anything about it. I said, no. And I don't know why he rang me, just out of the blue. And he told me all about it. And um, Mick Welsh, Mick Welsh called him. And uh, he said, I've got nothing to do with it. He said, I, I was, you know, uh, I, I didn't... Uh, have anything to do with all the scandal and all that kind of thing. But he was in the paper only that year because he'd gone to Belgium on a delegation to Belgium and he'd taken a conservative woman with him. Friend. Huh. Friend. But that was Mick. He was a good guy. Oh, OK. okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so was he... Was he one of these politicians? Yeah. Yeah, big style. Yeah, big left-winger. That you went to college with? And he was six foot six and he had a big voice. Wow. Big voice. Lovely bloke, though. We used to enjoy a drink or two. So what about the MPs from Westminster, Westminster MPs? Yeah. Uh, what was his name? Big Beard. Big fella. Beard. Bald head. Um, Martin Redman. Oh, right. Martin Redman. He was at college with me. Yeah. I don't know why I'm to Martin, actually. I, Somebody told me he died. Oh, wow. Yeah. Gosh. So, but it's a long time ago. You yeah. lose track. Yeah. You lose track. Yeah. And then I stayed on staff until the pit shut in 93. So I was on staff for 13 years, or just over. And uh, Hatfield was the last pit to close. Yeah under British coal. We never have thought that Hatfield would have been the last one to go, but it did, it hung on and hung on. We were breaking records, we were... Mm, we million were, tunnels. Yeah, it? yeah, we, we were cutting coal like nobody's business and they just closed us down anyway. I suggested, because I was on the um, union, I was, um, I was vice president of uh, the NACOS branch at Hatfield mm. and uh, we used to go into meetings with the manager every Monday morning after our meetings the previous day, our uni meetings, just to let him know what, you know, what had happened and what we needed and this and that and the other. And um, I used to say to him regularly, look, Gaffer, why don't we, when the pit does close, why don't we get together all the officials at the pit and hire it from British Coal and run it ourselves? And he used to say, no, nah, it won't work. And we said, well, why? And he used to come up with all kinds of reasons why it wouldn't work. And what did he do as soon as the pit closed? Did he? Did he? He bought the pit. Did he? Yeah. He bought the lease. Really? For a pound. Really? For a pound. But what he'd been doing... You can all your ideas. No, what he'd been doing, he'd been stashing equipment underground, no. hiding it and sealing it up. So, you need so that when the government people came to have a look round, they couldn't find it, couldn't see it. Really? Oh, yeah. And he ran that pit for about four or five years, and he made himself a millionaire and his cronies. Really? Yeah. First thing he did, he went out and bought four Range Rovers, brand new Range Rovers, and he gave one to all the... All his management? Management, yeah. Or cronies? Cronies. I like the guy. He was a brilliant guy to work with and work for. I worked with him since he was a non-staff from Rosington. And he was a great bloke. He was a man's man and he was a, he was a pit man. And there weren't very many pit men, hmm. even though there was thousands working in the pit, there weren't very many pit men. How do you define a pit man? A pit man, someone that enjoyed the job, thought a lot about the job, was conscientious, was... Um, 
dedicated to the pit, dedicated to the job. Yeah, and could do the job, you know, could sort a problem out when a, when a problem came up. Had the, the nous to be able yeah. to sort things out. Had the instinct. Yeah, the instinct, the ability, mm. and the know-how, you know. So he was the right man to get the pit then? Yeah, he was a very good manager, yeah, he was a pit man. Yeah, through and through. So did you kind of feel a bit miffed because you could have been in on the deal as it were? Well, at that time, yeah, but... A year later, I wasn't really bothered, you know. At that time, I thought to myself, right, I'm 42, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? And I was in Doncaster, walking around one day, it was a lovely sunny day in May, and I thought, what am I going to do, what am I going to do? And then I thought, right, I'm going to go to the college and find out what's available. All right. So I went to Doncaster College, the old one on Waterdale. Water yeah. And for some reason, they were on holiday. It must have been half term or something like that. And I walked in and there was one woman in there. She was on the top floor. So I went up, had a chat with her. He said, what do you want to do? I said, well, I said, I've always liked art all my life. Really? I said, and I've always liked horticulture, growing things. So she says, well, can you make your way to High Melton? I said, yeah. So I, I went off to High Melton. I had a look at the course there on horticulture. It was all right, but it didn't really, you know. Challenge you. Challenge, yeah. So I went back to the college and she said, hold on a minute, I've got a guy out at Doncaster College, the old college just up the road, mm -hmm. called Steve Hall. He's the head of fine art. He's gonna wait for you at the door. Go and have a chat. So I did. Yeah. I drove over and uh, Parked the car up at the front. No, I parked it in the car park. Yeah, that's right. I just walked past it actually. Brought a lot of memories back. And I, I went into Steve's office, it was a little tiny thing, little tiny cubby hole somewhere, and he got a cigarette out. And he said, Mel, do you want a fag? And I went, yeah, go on then. Because I used to smoke then. So I had a fag and a cup of tea, and we had a chat for about four hours. Four, four hours? hours, literally. God, he's a dedicated, he's, a, he's an art man, not a pit man. <laughs> We had a chat about life look at me a bit in general, right? And uh, and I said, right. Then when's my interview? He said, you've just had it. You started in September. Really? And how do you ready? So, so was this fine art or fine art? So you no portfolio. I no, didn't have nothing. You had nothing to show for it. So he took you on just because of your face was fitting. Yeah, and from what he'd uh, gleaned from yeah. my, you know, talking to him. Wow. And then I got a letter telling me to do some work. And I went, what? I've not done any artwork since I was at school. Wow. Since I was 15, 16. So they gave me a brief. And so I did what I could. Took it in on the day I started, which we all did. First time you met all your student friends. Yeah. I remember that day as well, really. It, to this Friday. day, I remember it. Friday. No, it was a day of your life. No. No, <laughs> it was so easy. It was so, I don't know, it, was, it just came. Natural, really? Yeah. And we put all the work out on the floor and everybody walked around and had a look at it and it was awful. Yours was or everyone's was? Everyone's. Right. Awful. We pinned it up in our workspace and it was there all the way through the 12 months. Really? Yeah. To show you? Just to see how far you'd come. It's quite interesting I do, isn't it? And uh, yeah, it soon went in the bin. Yeah. Yeah. And then I went on to university. So what was that course? That course would have been a, a B-Tech or something? Yeah, or? yeah. well, no, the B-Techs weren't out then. Or whatever they were. Whatever. It was something else. I've got the Diplo certificate. Diploma. Yeah, it was some kind of diploma, yeah. I got a, what did I get in that? I got a, what grade? I got a top grade. I got it out the other day. I looked it. And I, I, I acquired a top grade in, in art and design. Wow. And then I applied for university. And, and but I met so many interesting people at Doncaster mm. College. All tutors, by the way. Oh, right. As well as students, but yeah. mainly tutors. Yeah. And I kept in touch with them right up until the new college, this place opened. Mm. Yeah. And I've just learned that an old friend of mine's retired. He was in charge of printmaking. All right. He just retired. But he was a big influence on me because yeah. I love printmaking. 
So, so you went, where did you go and do your degree? Norwich. Really? School of Art and Design. That's my territory. George's, yes. So what dates were you there? 96 oh to goodness. 2002, but I, did, I graduated in 99. And what course did you do? They called it Visual Studies. Oh, oh yeah. Visual Studies. And I'm trying to think of the guys that taught me, well, tutored me. I'm trying to think of his first name, Martin. Martin, his proper name was Martini. He was of no. Italian descent. It wasn't Martin Welsh. No. no. He was a sculpture. No. A sculpture. No. And Chris Summerfield were there then. Chris was my no. course leader. No. Yeah. Well, he's one of my greatest friends. Is he? Yeah. He was my, he was my course leader. Was yeah. he really? What a wonderful guy. Yeah. So Chris was up. For a while. Yeah, and yeah. then he moved on. Was it sculpture? Yep. Yeah, he went yeah. into sculpture and... We got someone else, Chris, he was, he was from photography, Chris, oh, f do you know, I forgot, names go. names go, faces never do, I always remember faces, yeah. I've just been sat in reception, students coming in, and I remember most of them. Really? Yeah, from when I was at Danham, yeah. So you did your art, you did your visual studies course? Yeah. So you're going on a hell of a career life journey here. I know. Did you ever have an idea of what you wanted to be or do? No. So I, did it for, out of, out I did it for fun. And so you were funding this because of your mining pension, was it, or something? Or? No, I, um, I had to beg, borrow, and yeah. Wow, so to, it was a to big get on. sacrifice. Well, I'd, I'd just been div recently divorced. Good God, that was a whole new life. So I'd lost the house and everything, really. I had £2.50 in my pocket when I came out of court. My That's wife got everything. She got me redundancy pay, which amounted to about 50 grand. <clears throat> she got the house. I had £2.50 in a car. Good God. And I came out of court that day and I thought, £2.50, what do I do? Do I get a pint? Or do I put some petrol in the car? It was obvious, really. I'd put petrol in the car. Good God. How did you feel? Were you angry or were you like, like just... Angry, yeah, for quite a while. Yeah. A couple of years, maybe. But I didn't cause any trouble. No. You know, I let them get on with their life, my ex-wife and my kids. And I just went on to do other things. Were you, did you, have, did you see your kids? Oh yes, all the time. Oh good. Every, every half term, every, you know, every chance. Yeah. Yeah. Always did. Yeah. So you weren't estranged or? No. No. And I'm proud of that fact. And my kids now, I, I see them all the time. They live in um, Otley. Oh, really? They live in Otley, and I go every weekend. Otley uh, as in? Up the, up Yorkshire, the, North Yorkshire, yeah. There's an Otley in Suffolk as well. Oh, is there? Yeah. Otley oh. College, Agricultural College. Right. Is that called Otley? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, um, I, I know a lot about Suffolk. Really? Yeah, because I, uh, yeah. I had a relationship with a young lady from down there mm. for quite a while. Whereabouts in Suffolk? She was from Lowestoft. Yeah. Pakefield. Yep. Pakefield. She lived in Pakefield. Hence your time in Benneker. Yes. We used to travel all over. Photo with the cameras, of course. Wow. We used to borrow the, the big, um, we used to have a big wooden camera with a tripod. Like a Hasselblad kind of thing. Yeah. We had one of those and we used to carry it over marshes and... Really? Yeah, we used to carry it everywhere and we'd, we'd load the plates in college, you know, take them up over the marshes and Was on the beaches. Landscape, landscape photography? Yeah, mainly. We were both into landscape, Joe and I. Yeah. And everything I did, every drawing I did, if it was life drawing or whatever it was, people would come up and they'd go, landscape. Really? And I'd say, well, no, it's a person. <laughs> But they said, no, it's landscape. And everything I tried to do, they'd say, you're a sculptor, you're a sculptor. Oh, really? Yeah. And I was in one sense, because I enjoyed sculpture. I did enjoy sculpture. But I did everything on that course. Yeah, visual studies was good for a like, general... But that's why I did it, because I couldn't yeah. make my mind up yeah. what I wanted to do. Yeah. What I could have done with doing, really, was staying in college for another three years yeah. before I made my mind up. Yeah. But... No, I did everything. Printmaking, 
um, painting, drawing, of course, um, sculpture in all its many forms, all kinds of materials. I used to beg, borrow, and steal, you know, and make things out of that. Yeah. So, did you know Pete Blonston and the technician in the sculpture? Yeah, he helped me a lot. Yeah. I wanted to make this enormous piece of steel sculpture and I didn't know how to weld. Oh, he'd be the man. He took me on a crash course and yeah. within, within a few hours I was welding wow. and burning steel. Burning steel. He showed me how to cut through inch thick steel with, you know, with the tool. Oh, wow. Brilliant. Yeah. And what he taught me to do really was to weld thin steel together. Yes. Because you've got to have the right flame. That's if you don't have the right flame, it burns straight through. It's a torch rather. Yeah, torch, yeah, um, oxyacetylene. And I actually managed it. And I managed to get all these sheets welded together before I formed them. Wow. Yeah. And he had industrial rollers in there, and I used to roll them and all that kind of thing. So I do, I know him well. Mm. When I left there, he was exhibiting his sculptures, but he was into, at that time, Powder coating. Right. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He powder coated a lot yeah, of his work steel, yeah. in lots of bright colours, oranges and pinks yeah, and yeah, greens yeah. and yeah. Yeah. Well he's retired now. I think he will have, yeah. yeah. He, he was a bit older than me, I think, when I was there. He was a you thick know. guy, wasn't he? Yeah, very. Very. His sculptures were enormous, weren't they? Yeah. Enormous things. Big steel sculptures. Yeah. I used to spend a lot of time in printmaking up there as well. There was a guy up there with a beard, a bit of a hippie. I don't know his name, can't remember his name now. He helped me a lot. Because that's what you did in uni. You went to different departments yeah. and if had a used, look. If you used it well. And I did, I used it, I, I did use it well, yeah. And that's how you learn, you know? It's a big learning curve, university. It's about, it's about sourcing knowledge and material, isn't it? Mm. You know. So you weren't disappointed? Oh, no. No. And how did you... Loved it. Culturally, I mean, it's a bad, weird question. Yeah. But compare it to mining and the... Oh, a million miles away. Did you, did you find similarities? What did you find similarities? No. None. <laughs> Absolutely none. No camaraderie. It was a picture. million miles away from coal mining. Yeah. Million miles away. I remember coming back after being away for only six months. And I stood at the, on the top of the railway bridge looking at the pit and I went, my God, did I actually work there? Really? Yeah. They used to, I used to have a saying, I used to say, I went from the coal face to the chalk face yeah. when I became a teacher. Oh, so you became a teacher? Yeah. Okay. I did a PGCE at uh, Lancaster when I left Norwich. I left Norwich 2002. Lots of friends down there still, still go back. Really? Yeah. Still go back. Fantastic place. It's a beautiful place, isn't it? It is. It is. And because I lived there, you know, I used to explore every weekend. I used to go out onto all the beach. I've done every beach, I think, from Low Stuff to, to um, where? Um, Probably Wells. Wells, yeah. Wells. That's, that's the furthest north I ever went, I think. When I was in Were you driving? No, I'd sold the car. I had to sell everything to, to fund my um, course, you know, degree. She had to find a girlfriend with a car. She did. She had a car. She took me everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. I hope this is not going out onto the national thing. <laughs> no, not yet. Oh, thank God. Well, I'll not mention any names anyway. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so we ended up doing, so you decided that teaching was the way forward. You keep looking forward when I'm talking. Well, I, at first, I wanted to do an MA. I applied for an MA in London oh. at the Slade, yeah. and I got a place. Gosh, and well done you. Yeah, and I talked it over with my partner, she wanted to do a PGCE in Cambridge at the time. She wanted to teach. So she was, during her spare time, she was doing like little bits of teaching at different schools near Law Stuff. And like I say, I wanted to do an MA. We had a big bust up, big fallout. 
everything went pear shape in my final year. Oh no. Yeah, bad time. January it wasn't my final year. So I don't know what she did. I don't know whether she went and did a PGC or not. But prior to that, I agreed with her that I wouldn't do my MA, that I would settle down in Bakefield. Really? Yeah. That we'd live together, etc., etc. So I gave up the place, this oh. lane. I know, it's what you do for love. And uh, I don't know what happened then. She went on to do what she did. I had no idea what she did. So you'd made that decision and then you had your boss stop? Yeah. Yeah. That was a bit unfortunate. I know. Tell me about it. Big style. And it's lived with me ever since. So you couldn't reapply the next year, as it were? No. You only got the one chance at the slave. You know what the slave was like, you know. Yeah. So I lived in Norwich for a while. I went to work at a few places. I worked at Bertram's. Books. Remember Bertrand? Yeah. Went to work there for a while. Worked at Halfords. And then the time came for me to move on. Because I wanted to teach by then. I thought, right, I'm going to teach. That's all that's left at my age, you know, I was in my mid 40s. I thought, I've got to do something. So I, I went to teach. I went to Lancaster, did my PGCE. And it was the worst course I've ever been on in my life. Oh, Horrible course. Didn't enjoy it one bit. It was totally unlike university. Totally unlike university. And I taught at two schools in Lancashire. Plategate High in Blackburn. And the Royal Grammar School for Boys in Lancaster. That was a good school. Really? Yeah. That was that your politics. Oh, it's surprising. It was surprising. They had a history society. And what did they do? They asked me to talk about the miners' strike because it was the anniversary. Wow. And uh, so I did. I stood in the main hall and talked to, like, I don't know, probably 200 kids and really? staff. Yeah. Oh, they took to questions. That was the main thing, you know. And there was one lad there. I always remember him. Year eight. He said, Sir... My dad was in the miners' strike. So, oh, yeah, which pit did he work at? He said he didn't. He was a copper. Oh, God. <laughs> and he was. Manchester policeman. Yeah. So what did you teach? Art. Oh, really wonderful. And maths. Really? What a combination. Wow. What a combination. Art and maths. I used to love maths. I think I like maths as much as art. Really? Mm. Yeah, I used to love it. But, uh, and then I retired two years ago. Oh, right. So how long were you teaching? From 2004, 2004, till 2017, yeah. So, oh, and uh, at this private school? No, no, I, uh, I left Lancashire and came back to Doncaster. I met lots of people there as well. What a lovely place, Lancaster. Mm. Marvellous place. We've got loads of pubs as well, because I used to drink real ale. And uh, I don't drink now at all. I don't drink, don't smoke, you know, don't so much at all. There's a reason for that, just to keep yourself healthy. Yeah, mainly. I just went off it, just stopped drinking. Just... Totally fell out with beer, totally. Just picked a pint up one day and went, I don't want that. You know. And yet I love beer. Yeah. Loved it. Beer and pit work and, and art went hand in hand, yeah. you know. Yeah. So where did you teach in Doncaster? So I came back to Doncaster and applied for a teaching job at Doncaster, couldn't get one. Tried everywhere. So I thought, do I really want to teach? And I thought, no, I don't. But I want to work in education. I did a lot of um, work with my brother, because my brother works for the local authority. He is a, he's a, um, um, a countryside ranger for the local authority. And he, um, he got me a few jobs in schools, doing clubs oh, right. with 
tiny kids. And it was brilliant. I loved it. We were making sculpture. I'd split them all up into little groups, and you make the head, and you make the hands, and you make the legs, and you make this, and, and then we put it all together, really, and make this massive, you know, we made birds, we made kestrels wow. that were like 20 foot wingspan and all that kind of thing. Uh, withies, just withies and, you know, and weaving and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I did a bit, a bit of that. And then um, I, one day my brother, another brother of mine, I've got five brothers, all right, came in and he said, there's a job going at Danham. I said, yeah, what is it? It's not teaching, is it? He went, no, as um, a TA. So I went as a TA. And I worked as a, as, a, as a TA for 10 years. And you like that, but you prefer that to teach you? Yeah. No responsibility or? Yeah, that was the main thing. Yeah. If you want the truth, I didn't mind working in schools, but I didn't much like the people I worked with. Mm. And I'm gonna be honest. I'm gonna be honest. I didn't. There was no camaraderie. I was used to working in a coal mine where everybody looked after each other. Yeah. Everybody worked as a team. Yeah. Everybody worked for a common cause, but in schools, no. there was none of that. Mm. And that's why schools fail, mm. because everyone's for themselves and not for the cause. And I don't mind who hears that, mm. because it's the truth. It's the truth. So I wanted to work with kids because, you know, they're our future, aren't they? Mm. And I enjoy working with kids because Kids are open-minded. They've got no or very little baggage. Um, quite friendly as well, kids, believe it <laughs> or not, you know. I used to love working with sixth formers. When I worked at Halfords, we'd get sixth formers coming to me. Well, all we talked about was work, you know, what they were doing in A-level and can I help you out with this, can I help you with really? that? Say, what about me? They used to call me sir, by the way. <laughs> yeah, because I was older than them, you know. And I used to help them with the homework. Yeah. Really? Yeah. The guy in Halfords? Yeah. We help them with the maths. Fantastic. Yeah. And art as well. Lots of art students used to work there. Part time. So yeah, that's what I did. I was TA for 10 years. And, uh, and then when Outwood took over in 2017, called it a day. I'll give it a go. Yeah. I was looking forward to seeing what changes it could bring to the school. You know, because we were failing in lots of things, mm. even though the head might say differently. She was a lovely woman, but, you know. So Outwood came in in September and I started uh, afresh under Outwood, and I left in October. So I lasted two months. Oh, God. It wasn't for me. So what are you doing now? I'm retired and I do absolutely nothing when it comes to work, because I don't need to. Mm. I've got several pensions. I've been collecting my pit pension since I was 50. Really? So I've had about 200 grand out of them now. Good God. But I paid a lot into it at the time. Yeah. It was a superannuated pension. Best thing I ever did. Mm. And yeah, I don't know really, I don't know what I want to do now. I've not made my mind up. Are you making art? No, but I'm starting. I've made a conscious decision to start again. Yeah. But Did you I'm, ever make it independently of an institution? Mm, Did you ever work outside a structure as it were? No. Personal motivation or that? No. No. Maybe I should have. Well, that's what artists do, sadly. Yeah, I know they do. <laughs> and they don't make a lot of money, do they? No, they don't. And that, that was the reason why I didn't, you know, I, <clears throat> I, had, to, I had to work. Yeah. And when you work, especially in teaching, you don't get time. So. God, yeah. But now I've got all the time in the world. Yeah. It's difficult to motivate yourself, is it, or not? No. But, not. but I'm, I'm in conflict. All right. Two things. Mm. One. The side of me that wants to do the art that I left off doing, mm. which was fine art. <clears throat> and then this painting yeah. in watercolour. 
the horticultural side's coming out of me oh, again. Oh, wow. Flowers. I love yeah. flowers. I love them. So I'm, I'm painting flowers at the moment. Lovely. Yeah, believe it or not. They're brilliant. Yeah. I started off quite simply just by painting a flower and then it's moved on. and I don't know what it'll, where it'll take me. I've got no idea. Beautiful. I mean, I did that. I started painting bird's nests. Yeah. Just for no reason. Yeah. Other than I could collect them. And They're beautiful objects, just aren't they? Try and really try not to be an artist, but just to be an observer. Study. Mm. Just look, look, look. Draw to study. Yeah. And forget the art business. Just enjoy yeah, yeah, yeah. the relationship. And I really, I, I really enjoyed it. And I can't wait to get back to that. <laughs> yeah. So you, are you, you're doing watercolours in watercolour. Right? At the moment, I've got some gouache as well. I like gouache. Mm. It's lovely quality. Um, oils, acrylics. I love all of them. This is this is the course coming up again, isn't yeah, yeah. it? You know, try everything, and, and I just can't stick to one thing. Yeah. I can't. I'll start on flowers, and I'll probably move to something else. Yeah. But I like hands-on. I like to make. Yeah. You know. So do you have a studio? What sort of house you got? You got a studio type thing? Or no, I've got a little pokey house. You know, that's no space whatsoever. My kitchen is the best room in the house yeah. and uh, because it's bright, it's bright, south facing and uh, so Do you live by there. yourself? Yeah, yeah. I've been single since 1999. Good Lord. I know, that's what I say. <laughs> so <laughs> Several you, times a day. You got used to it now? Yeah. Did it take getting used to it? Yeah, it did at first. Yeah, it was a bind at first, yeah. Because I'd always been in a relationship since, you know. But no, since then I've not bothered. Mm. Well, I have. I've but dabbled. Not with. I've dabbled, yeah. But no, no, not cohabitated now. No. I think you become independent after a while. You know, you don't want anyone else to meddle in your life. Yeah. You know, after you've gone through several instances of breakup, yeah. uh, you think, no, you, I don't want that again. So you don't do it. Yeah. It's tempting. It was tempting. But no. You tend to walk away. Mm. And I've done that lots of times, and women have questioned me about that. They've said, how come that when you come over and you talk to us, we want you to stay, but you don't. You go, you move off. You, you walk away. That's, I don't know. That's probably the, you know, frightened yeah. <laughs> of the well, consequences. I mean, it sounds of like staying. you've had. You sounds like you've. Yeah, what's the word? You've had a hard time as far as having to get over a serious yeah, setback. Yeah, twice, twice, twice. The second term was the worst. Really? Yeah. Which one was that? Why? Which one was that? We oh, that was the one in, in Paintfield. In, yeah. So you kind of lost a career with the painful one, or yeah. you, haven't you? Yeah, it totally, well, I don't know what words I could use. It totally buggered my life up, mm. really, you know. I just live day to day. Yeah. It's surprising. You wouldn't have thought that a strong guy that worked in the pit would be subdued by, you know. Artists. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lovely material, isn't it? This is wax. What kind yeah. of wax is it? It's a modelling wax right. that I get from a specialist company in London called the British Wax Refining Company. Right. And it's got, it's got a... Does it stay soft? No, it goes hard. They're all going hard in there. That Does it? Your arm is too... So, is that as hard as it gets? Have a look. Yeah. 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 And it breaks up pretty quick. But with the warmth of your hand and yeah. working it... It gets very hard in the cold in this room temperature. So it's just by working it that it softens up? Yeah. yeah. And, and you chew it as well, don't you, too? I well, do. you, you hold it in your mouth yeah, just exactly. to warm it up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And what happens is... It tastes all right. What do you think? Well, it's tasteless. Yeah. There's nothing there. It's tasteless. But I just had you a bit... Kids would love this, wouldn't they? Yeah. Kids would love it. Well, the great thing is it goes straight into bronze. I haven't got it. There's no... These ones don't go straight into bronze, but you could. Well, I knew loads of maquettes, little figures. Yeah. Out of these like a, every day, yeah, and they go straight into bronze. So you've been doing business. Well, I've got my own foundry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I've got my own setup. Do you know a guy from Suffolk called? Um, oh, what a fantastic guy he was. Um, oh, 
John Chipperfield. Yes, I think he's. Is he still alive? I don't know. He's a great guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a man. Yeah, he had his own studio in. Yeah, yeah. Um, where was it now? It was in Norfolk, wasn't it? Uh, yes, just outside Norwich. Yeah. It, he took us to his studio one day and we did Raku firing. Wow. Oh, fantastic. What a guy, though. Yeah, yeah. Lovely bloke. Very sensitive. He used to wear black and white every time we went to Italy. Oh, really? So he was teaching, was he, at the time? Yeah. He'd come in as a visitor, you know, as a visiting yeah, yeah, yeah. tutor. Yeah, and he taught us uh, ceramics. Brilliant guy. Yeah. Wow, man. Yeah. He used to wear black and white striped clothing when he went to Italy. <laughs> because he, he loved the um, Renaissance um, yeah. architecture, you know, all those The Mil Milanese, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Brilliant. Great guy. See, people like that yeah. influenced me. And Mickey Bunn. Yeah, I don't know Mickey Bunn. <laughs> he's from here, isn't he? Yeah, he's doing school, teaching sculpture. He's great. He got me into all kinds of trouble. I'm talking about mentally now, oh, really? with, with the work yeah. that I used to do, you know. Yeah. What sort of work did you do? Oh. Were you a figurative artist or a... No. Abstract -y? Abstract mainly, yeah. Function. Yeah? Function, yeah. When you say function, what do you mean? I don't know. It didn't have a function really, but it, it was... It looked functional? Or? Well, yeah, in a way. It was tension, a lot of tension. Materials in tension. I messed about with that for quite a long time. Wood, metal, plastics. Glued my fingers to the wall with super glue many a time. Yeah. But Mickey Bunny was figurative, wasn't he? You know, wasn't he? Yeah, made steel. He used to get steel from skips and things like that and burn it and shape it and, yeah, figurative. He was doing the, um, the rib cage, of, rib cage of a, um, you know, last time I saw him working, but he's probably moved on from that. Mm. But, yeah. And he combined natural materials with his steel. Wood. Wow. Skin. Skin? Animal skin. Bones. Hide. Yeah, all that. He'd, he'd bury animals in the ground that were dead. He'd find roadkills and bury them. And then he'd dig them up later when they'd rotted away and just take out what was left and combine it with his sculpture. Yeah. But his drawing as well, I used to like his drawing because he used to use pencil, but he used to use, um, um, what do call those pencils, the French pencil, pencils? Conte crayon. Yes, Conte crayon. He used to use that as well combined with the pencil and it was brilliant how he used it, you know. Lots of influences. You take influences, don't you? You take things from other people. Yeah. We do as artists anyway. We yeah. don't just get it straight out of the head, do we? No. You know, it's what we see and what we we steal. We yeah. steal all the time, don't we? Yeah. And that's how you make your work. I did do a bit of work, I tell a lie. When I was in Lancaster, I was at a loose end. So I enrolled with a ceramics uh, course at Lancaster College. Not because I wanted to, uh, I just wanted to use their materials and, and um, you know, fire the clay and mm. that kind of thing. Facilities. So I just did all my old thing. And the tutor must be walking around thinking, what's this guy doing here? You know? mm. But he went along with it. He used to come up and sit with me and talk to me about it and, really? and yeah, and that kind of thing. And it, it, yeah, and I've still got the, the work at home. Really? I went with the intentions of doing what I'd drawn. And I did. And fired it and everything. And I learned a lot there as well, a lot more than I did at Norwich. Really? Yeah. Because he was a technician as well, you see. So he, um, are you heating those knives up? Yeah. Ah, on a very low heat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and he, um, yeah, he showed me how to use. He showed me how to use uh, clay in a leather form. All right. And that's the only way you can work clay. Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah, yeah I'd take it to a leather, and then you can do anything with it. Yeah. I remember a ceramist here at this college, at the old Doncaster Art College. She came from Wakefield College. She was a tutor there, but she used to come here one day a week. I've forgotten her name. 
lovely woman. She used to make fabrics mm. from clay. Wow. And she showed me one day how she did it. And she, she rolled this clay out as thin as she could get it, and then she picked it up. And she's working it with her hands, without it falling apart. Wow. And she worked it with her hands like that, so it fell like fabric. And yeah, and left fantastic, it. fantastic work that she did. She wanted me to go to Wakefield to do a degree there in ceramics. But I didn't fancy that. I wanted to do everything. Yeah. But some of the work I saw there at Wakefield was fantastic. Some of the ceramic work they were doing at the time. Putting fish in clay and wow. putting it in the kilns and burning the fish away and just, you know, yeah. what was left. And I love experimenting. I love it. If I had my, if I had the money and the, I'd have a place like this and I'd have like different compartments and have ceramics over there, I'd have printmaking over there, I'd have, you know, a kiln over there. You'd have I'd your own art college. Yeah, if I had my own art college, yeah. You know, it used to crease me when I used to go to schools. You'd walk into the art department and all the art equipment was hidden away in a storeroom. They didn't use it anymore. Really? All the kilns. Kilns were there doing nothing. Thousands of pounds worth. Mm. Presses. Yeah. You know the flatbed presses? Yeah. They got those hidden away. Didn't use them. One hour, one hour. Because most, most of the teachers couldn't do that kind of thing. No. Clay and printmaking. Were you in a position to get it going again? Yeah, but I didn't have the time. No. Yeah, the time. And it wasn't on the curriculum. End of story. I'm on the uh, GCSE question this year. Oh, yeah, the, the, the school phone. I said, did you realise you were in the GCSE paper? So what so was this? Like, this is like the texture. Da -da -da. So from the prehistory, they did this, the Egyptians did this. Da -da 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 -da. And Lawrence Edwards uses it like that. Oh. Do a project. Right. That means you've arrived, doesn't it? <laughs> After all those years. I can believe it. After all those years. That was amazing. AQA paper. You just give me the answer now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you could look forward, I'll do the side. I used to like photography as well. Conventional photography, you know. In fact, when I went to Danem, the art teacher there, the head of year, head of department, he opened up the dark rooms there for the first time. And I helped him out because he didn't know that I'd done photography at uni. And there was one day the technician didn't turn up and he said, I need to mix this, this, and this, and this. But my technician's not here, what can I do? I said, well, I'll do it for you. And they looked at me and he went, can you do it? I said, yeah. So I did. Did you ever go in the dark room at church for you? Yes. That was a good dark room. Lots of times. Yeah. He was a great guy, the guy that ran it. Alan Neal? Yeah. yeah. Brilliant guy. Cynthia would have been there. She was a photographer. Cynthia, yeah, yeah. What yeah. happened well, to Cynthia? She is no more. She passed uh, about four. four or five years ago. Maybe. Oh, did she? Yeah. Oh. She came here with us. Yeah. We moved to the new building, but then, yeah. It's a shame. Alan passed away as well, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, I've still got some old photographs that I developed here, printed and developed. They weren't very good. <laughs> Most of mine aren't. It must be the building. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, I've just got to dash. Oh, OK. Back. Oh, you'll be back? Yeah, just got to drop the car so they can get this. All right. I bet this cost you a fortune, didn't it, hiring this place out? Well, lucky they've, they've let me have it. Have they? Yeah. God, you're lucky. And all this wonderful staff. Look at this. Yeah. Are they volunteers? They're students who are... Students? Yeah. Of... Photography, all photography. Film and TV. What, from here? Yeah. Ah. You know, they had a fantastic uh, film and photography um, department at Norwich. I don't know whether they've still got it, but it was, it was uh, very well renowned, you know. Yeah. yeah. I went there and I used to 
I used to hire a camera for the weekend. Big Hasselblad. With a big stand like that, all made of wood and brass. I was telling you about it earlier, wasn't it? Yeah. Sign it out for the weekend. <laughs> Tell you what's good, working with other people mm. in an art in an artistic way. Collaboration. Collaboration, yeah, it's brilliant. I've, I've done that, but I've not really done anything serious. You have to make a living, you see. Yeah. That's the trouble. Photography is easy, though. All you do is carry a camera around with you all day, innit? You know, take pictures of whatever you fancy. Go back to the studio, <laughs> develop them. And it's all done on computers now, isn't it? Do you think it's winding you up? <laughs> of course I am. <laughs> so did you come from a mining family? You've got five brothers, you say? Yeah, that was the only one that went down the pit. Really? Yeah. No, my dad was a joiner. All right. My granddad was a miner. He was the only one in the family, my granddad, that was a, an ex-miner. And was that from around here? He was at Hatfield, yeah. All right. Well, he came from uh, Wigan. Wigan? In the 20s. The late... I heard that, Mel. <laughs> <laughs> he came from Wigan in the late 20s, because they were closing pits down in Lancashire. And they were just opening the new pits up in Doncaster at that time. So he came to Donny and he got a job at Atfield and a house that went with it, a new house. And um, yeah, he, um, he was an ex, he fought in the first war. He got shot in the chest here. And the bu bullet went ricocheted through and came out of his elbow. You're joking. Yeah. Got shot where? Here. And it ricocheted through. It went and it came out of his elbow. Yeah. So all the time I knew him, because he, he was a very old man. Well, he wasn't an old man, really. He was 70 when he died. But he was old to me, because I was only 12 when he died. But he used to sit in a chair near the fire with a blanket over his legs. And he used to he used to have a long thumbnail and he used to split tab ends open and put the tobacco in a tin and then make cigarettes out of it and smoke them. Really? Yeah. But he fought in the First War. And, Where did um, he fight? He fought in Egypt. Oh, crikey. And in India. He was based in India and Egypt. He just missed out on Gallipoli. Really? Yeah. He'd have been at Gallipoli if he hadn't have been shot. God. And the invalided him out because of his arm. Was that a lucky break, do you think? In one sense, yeah, and he still got a job back down the pit. Really? Yeah, the one-handed job. So uh, his arm was buggered? Yeah, yeah, from about 19, I think he was 20 years old. Yeah. God. And my other granddad, he, f he was at, um, he was with the Pathfinders in the second war. And he came back on the boats from, um, what's it called? Remember the Pathfinders went out? Mm -hmm. uh, the, sorry, the expeditionary force, British expeditionary mm -hmm. force went out. Was that up over the Arctic? When, no, when Ger Germany went into Poland. Right. It's part of the agreement that we backed them up, so we sent two or three hundred thousand soldiers over there. And, um, yeah, we got massacred, didn't we? What, he, what, how did he fare in that? Well, he got back to the beaches um, and then a, an anti-aircraft gun swung around and smashed his hip. And it was, it was like that, right up to him dying. He had one leg short and the other because of that. And the pin used to snap regularly. Oh, so they had to take him in and put a new pin in. And, um, he used to put his socks on in a weird way. He'd put his foot on a chair backwards. Put his sock on backwards, you know, like that. Because he couldn't do that. So how did he do it? 
He, he used to stand up and he'd put his foot on the chair oh, like right. that and do it that way. Because he couldn't lift his leg up. And he used to put an extra inch on his shoe. When he bought a new pair of shoes, he'd put an extra inch on himself. He had a last. And he'd put an extra inch on. But he worked at the plant until he died. Plant what plant was that? At Doncaster Rail. Oh, OK. He, he used to say he worked in the chemist shop. And he worked in the... Um, it was the laboratories. They had scientists that worked there, didn't they? Yeah. yeah. He worked in there. He used to go to work in Collantyre every day. He worked down the pit for a while. Not for long, though. So really, I didn't, I didn't have anyone in, in the family that worked in the pit, apart from me. And where were you working in the pit? Well, I worked at Rosington. I mean, where, what, what part of the... You were, you were below ground? Oh, yeah, all the time, yeah. From day one right up to the last day. Were you at the coal face or...? Yep, all the time. I did... How many years did I do at the coal face? About 23. No. 22 years I did on the coal face. There was nowhere else to be. Mm. Well, it's best money, wasn't it? That was a good, good money, and, but that's where all the action was, you see. I used to have 40 men. Because you were a deputy, weren't you? Mm. So I had four rippers on each gate, four on the left hand, four on the right hand. I had 11 men on the coal face itself. I had. And are these teams you organise yourself? Yeah. So you're like a cricket captain, you, you're put, putting your men in? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I used to get the, the gist from the previous shift as to how the face was left. And. Um, then I used to get them all sat round and I'd say, right, I want you to go so and so, you do so and so. And they'd do it like that. Yeah. So what's it like to go from having that authority to having none? Yeah. I mean, going to be a student and... It was strange, really, because when I went to work in... You know, when I was at uni, I had to work part-time. Yeah. I used to work in factories and all that kind of thing, and I used to look at what they did and think, my God, no wonder they... With you know, things are getting worse. I had no idea how to organise at all. That's one thing that Pitwork taught me, organisation. Mm. We used to have a saying um, in the pits, in Doncaster anyway, F-T-O-T-E-T, -E first time, on time, every time. And that's what we were taught, you know, to make sure that everything was done properly. And everything had to be safe, so it had to be done right. That was my job, going round with my hammer. It's a seven-pound hammer. And I used to walk round, and all the wooden props that were set, I used to bang them like that as I walked past them. And if they didn't give me a thud, I'd get the men back out to reset it, because they didn't, you didn't want a prop that rung. Yeah. It had to go good. How often would that happen? Quite often. We had a tailgate on 103s, and... Uh, the rings in the tailgate, because of the weight that came on, one day it's as high as this, the following day it was that high. I look forward just a second. Sorry. It was only yeah. a few feet high, yeah. The weight used to come on that quick. I saw a junction as big as this room, built out of steel girders that were probably 12 inch by 12 inch steel girders, H girders, and I saw that gate coming in one week, Good. down to a foot. Really? Yep. Yep. That's incredible geology though, isn't it? That's how it was, yeah. All you did was control the roof. You didn't support it, you controlled it. Yeah, or tried to. Yeah. We used to have what they call a front abutment on the coal face, and that was the weight that was thrown forward from the gob. So when you advanced the supports, if the gob flushed, it would take all the weight off the front, and it would keep all the connies up. But if the gob didn't break, and it stayed up, stayed up and stayed up. It would throw all the weight onto the front. So when you lowered your chokes off the top, the whole lot come in. That was geology for you. Yeah. And in the old days, they used to put cuckoo shots in the gob. They'd drill holes into the gob, put powder in and blow it, just to break the gob up. And that became illegal in the early 70s, I think it was. 
because it ignited gas. Yeah. There was a few accidents. Yeah. So how does it, I mean, going from that kind of authority and being and that respect and knowing and, and a culture that kind of like is understood and, you know, you can walk down the street and that sort of thing, mm. to go into a, an, an art college atmosphere, mm. which I suppose at best is kind of, would it be called, how would you describe it, laissez-faire? Mm. Kind of chilled, yeah, yeah. relaxed? Very, very. How does it, how does that, how do you compute all the, all the stuff you know, all that kind of knowledge, all that kind of, culture from the mind mm. and, and transfer that in, into a life of... I think it was quite easy for me because because of the discipline and because of the rules that we were to underground it was it was like a holiday mm. it was a break from that kind of thing if you like and I found it so easy mm. so easy I remember the first day when I walked into class it was a room maybe twice the size of this I, the studios there were fantastic. They were like twice the size of this and they got pent roofs. So you're Plus, talking Doncaster? Yeah, the one over the road, the old one. Yeah. Still there, the building. Mm. And the roofs were that, like that, glass, because they were purpose-built studios. And parquet floors, and all that kind of thing. And I remember walking in, and all the, all the students were there. They were all a lot younger than I was. I was 40 years old at the time. And uh, it was only a few weeks later, and I always remember some, one of the younger students came up to me and she says, do you know when you walked into the room that day? And I said, yeah. She says, we all thought you were a drug dealer. <laughs> yeah. I said, what, me, a drug dealer? She said, I know, but that's the impression we got. I said, why? She said, you just gave off that aura of being in command. And I went, did I? <laughs> yeah. Surprising what people think. Were people interested, uh, students, in, I mean, for example, in Norwich, were they interested in your mining past? Or was it something Nearly everybody was, yeah. yeah. Everybody. So it, Everywhere yeah. I go, they still are now. Yeah, so in the pub, it, you, the end of the evening, it would always be really end up you talking about history. Yeah, a lot of people, yeah. People that were, you know, because the pub I used to go to in Norwich was a fantastic place and still is. And the landlord's still the same guy that was there in 96. And uh, what I used to like was happy hour. Yeah. I used to leave college at half five and walk down there for happy hour. And um, the people that were in there were fascinating to me because they were from all walks of life. They were mainly professional people. You know, you got solicitors and doctors and all that kind of thing. And it was fantastic talking to them. Mm. Brilliant talking to them. Yeah, and that's all they asked me about coal mining. What was it like in the pits? And, and the, I understand. And the strike and everything. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of, having done this now a little while, kind of understand a little bit of the culture and the hierarchy and the kind of you as a deputy and the men and all that Dear. stuff. I mean, like, a little bit. I'm not saying I know. Have the, told, have, have the workman told you? Yeah, you know, he, he was a deputy. Like, what Did, does that have you mean? had many deputies then no, come no, forward? We had, I think we've had two. Yeah. Surprised yeah. me, that. Yeah. Because the workmen, hmm. But putting across that culture, to students and stuff. I mean, it's a completely different. I mean, do they understand it to that kind of subtlety and degree? Do you think? Were you able to explain that kind of hierarchy and no. culture that you live in? No, people know weren't interested in it. No, no, no. They want to know the headlines. They, they were, they were more interested in what it was like to work underground yeah. in a confined area. Yeah. That's all, really. They weren't bothered about the culture or the... So, uh, I mean, they wouldn't, know, wouldn't understand you then. I mean, what, no. I, what I'm saying is I understand. They had no idea what I did. What you were in a mine. They thought I went down the pit with a pick yeah. and a shovel. And they thought... And hacked at the coal yeah. Yeah. and shoveled it That's all right. day yeah. and then went home. So how does it... What's it like being in a culture in a place where you were obviously in complete control of it? Not control, but you were in, as I said, had a position of... Position of power, I suppose, mm -hmm, yeah. and, then, and, and, a, and a culture that was completely understood itself and a camaraderie, like, it was really intense to go to a place like that. And then the, the questions they ask you are so trite, <laughs> so naff, <laughs> so kind of stereotypical. Yeah. And it must be quite a difficult... They were, the questions were, but I enjoyed explaining right. or trying to so paint did you explain a picture. Rear, rear, you know, you know, Front of and... Bit, bit of, yeah, types of mining. Gobs and yeah, things like and all that. that. Difficult to explain that to anyone. Mm. Unless you've actually seen it, you wouldn't have a clue what I was talking no. about. You wouldn't have a clue. I mean, most of the time, I imagine, they think you were in a tunnel 
mm. at, the, at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. And I even thought how the coal would come out, mm. let alone this kind of advancing face and mm. all these kind of wheels and all that sort of stuff. And the, the, face, the faces I had were worth four million quid. Wow, that's interesting. So what, what, when you say we're worth, what, the one line? Yeah, the, the equipment. The equipment? The equipment was four million quid worth, and I was in charge of that. That was my um, responsibility. Everything that went on on that coal face was my responsibility. The machinery, the coal cutting, and the men. The safety aspect, everything. Mm. Everything was my sole responsibility. That's incredible. Even the manager couldn't come on my unit without my permission. Yeah. He wasn't allowed on until I said, yes, you can come on. And the HMI, you know, the uh, inspector of mines, quarries. He couldn't come on my unit without phoning me and saying, uh, this is so-and-so, so-and-so. I'm at your meeting station now. Um, and I'd say, yeah, I'll come out and meet you. Yeah, it was mine. No one else's. Yeah, so it was that. mine for eight hours. It's incredible. No one else's, just mine. And did you enjoy that responsibility? I did. It didn't go to my head, though. No. You know, I didn't like it, did some. Some deputies were, yeah. Enjoyed being deputies. Yes. Yeah, they did. Did you mix in the deputy mess? <laughs> yeah, I did. Had... I had to, really, and I did, to a certain extent. But we all have our own way of working. It's like when you go into teaching, you have your own way of teaching. Yeah. And you get a lot of criticism. I used to get criticism at the pit. Usually men that didn't know what they were talking about. You know, other well, deputies that didn't have a clue what it was like to work on the coal face. Yeah. So you were quite an unusual, I mean, you are an unusual deputy, even by my experience. Uh, but you uh, worked your way up through the mines, so you mm. had probably a, a different relationship to the deputy that would come out of the training colleges and the courses, mm. officer class, you know. Mm. So were you an unusual kind of deputy in that sense? Yeah, I had a, I had a brain, dare I say. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say they were good at what they did. A lot of the deputies were very good at what they did, pit work. Yeah, but they didn't know anything else. That's all they knew. Yeah, that's why I went to college. Yeah. You know, I got the opportunity. The NUM said to me, "Do you want to go to college?" Yeah, so I went to college. And I learned about politics and economics, mm -hmm. and I'm still interested today. Yeah. And last night, when I put news night on, and all they talked about was somewhere else, I didn't want to know because mm -hmm. I want to know about Brexit. I'm fascinated by it. Yeah. It's an exercise in human nature. Mm. It is, isn't it? Yeah, big style. Yeah. Do you know what I think will happen? Um, no. I think what will happen with Brexit is we won't go to another vote. We will go for a softer Brexit. Yeah, we'll go for a softer Brexit. And we'll end up being back in the union, but with less power. Much less power. Yeah. We're never going to renegotiate what we've got. Exactly. They go back. Well, how could, yeah, I don't know. Personally, I would have liked us just to walk away from Europe and said, right, sod you, we're going to go our own way. But I thought that's what everyone was voting for, really. Yeah. Everyone we were. thought that was what's going to happen. We were. And I don't think anyone really thought that the politicians would be. Quite so, um, what's the word, influential? <laughs> but basically, I think, yeah. Inept. It's quite a shock, isn't Inept, it? Inept, I think, I think that's quite, the word. It's quite shocking. I thought that once we voted to come out, that what we would do, all the politicians would get their heads together in Parliament and say, right, we're going to come out and this is how we're going to do it. No, didn't happen like that. Yeah. Prime Minister took over. She wanted to stay in Europe anyway. Yeah. And she's just dragged it on and dragged it on and dragged it on, on purpose, by the way. You think so? Oh, of course, it's all planned. Why do you think she can still come out at number 10, put a straight face on? Mm -hmm. It's all planned. It's all planned. She knew exactly how it was going to go, and she knows what the outcome's going to be. She's just stringing everyone along. I'm happy as long as Labour don't get in at the next general election. Yeah. Are you a Labour man? I am. But I don't want that crowd to, become, to get into power. They'll totally ruin the country. Totally. They're living in the 70s. Mm. I, was, I was a, 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 a left-winger, mm. you know, in the 70s. 
There was a time and place for everything, and that was it. Yes. The best thing that happened in the pits was when the uh, miners went on strike for a year. Because? Because we were given, the management were given back the right to manage. Because before that, the union managed. Okay. They picked the teams, they picked the men. Yeah. But once the strike was over, 1985, when I went back down the pit, the manager pulled us in and he said, right, for the first time in the history of British coal, we can manage the pit. And he gave me a list of men and he says, pick your teams out of that. And I looked and I picked my team. First time ever it really? had happened. Yeah, yeah. The teams were always picked by the union. Really? Yeah. The pits were run by the unions. That's why, you know, it was a good thing that I got paid all the way through the strike. Did you? Yeah. Because? I worked one day out of 12 months and got paid a full year's salary because I was on staff. I wasn't on strike. Bloody hell. How did that go down with you in the, in the world of in the social life? No, nobody really bothered. It, when I went back to the pubs, you know, at the weekends, there, there were still miners in there that had been on strike for six, seven months. They were still um, drinking. Right. So I made you wonder where the money came from, you know. So did you pick it at all then? You stayed out of it? No, because we weren't on strike. NACODs weren't on strike, you see, the deputies union. Mm. We did vote to go on strike, but Thatcher intervened. She called a meeting uh, between the union officials and herself and um, offered a pay rise. Really? Yeah, 25% pay rise. To stay in work? To stay uh, yeah, out of it, so we did. We had a ballot and we opted for the 25% pay rise. That didn't go down well. It didn't. The NUM weren't, weren't very happy. But when the strike was over, they only went wanted to come back into our pension scheme. They opted out in 1962. Really? Yeah. And they wanted to come back in it. We said, no chance. Yeah, it was uh, the good old bad old days, I call it. I see footage now, you know, on YouTube of men walking out the pit at Hatfield. Mm walking across the pit yard in 1982 or something like that before the strike. And uh, it's like another world. Yeah. It's like another world. It'd be nice to be able to just go back to 1982, walk down pit lane, put my rags on, go down pit and go to unit that I worked on in 1982, as I am now. Mm. Be lovely. Why? Because we only remember the good bits. We never remember the bad bits. Mm. And there were a lot of bad bits about pit work. There were days when it was really hard work. Really hard work. I've seen me come home with no skin on my hands. Mm. None at all. Jesus. They were the bad days when you were working in water. I worked on a unit called 70s, and it was coming in all the time. And you know what I was talking about, the weight? Mm. The weight was coming on the supports. And these supports were blowing off all the time. You could hear it. Psss, psss. And by, day by day, they were getting lower and lower and lower. And the canopies were resting on the side ends of the face, which were as high as that stool. And we had a crawl under that. And we were in there, cutting through six by six girders with hacksaw. Jesus. Yeah. Cutting through. It'd take us a shift to get through a six inch by six oh inch girder. God. <coughs> Just so that we could get through to the other side. Yeah. And we were all in there. There were six men in there as the roof came in. And it just kept coming. No well, stop. Nothing protects you. For five minutes. And we were under this steel what? canopy. And how strong was the steel? Well, it was thick steel, oh, right, fabricated okay. so steel. You, you were witnessing a roof above your heads yeah. coming in. It was just coming and coming and coming and coming and coming all the time, and all it was was dust, and we were all just scrunched up like this, waiting for it to stop. Jeez. And eventually it did. 
And we looked at each other and we went, my good God, what are we doing here? Give us that axle. Really? Went back onto it. Yeah, conditions like that. Unbelievable conditions. But it was a way of life. The dust used to hurt when you breathed it in. God. When the machine was shearing through the fault, it was going through sandstone. And it had shear through and it was white dust. You couldn't see that far in front of you. And if you breathed in, it hurt. So what we used to do, we used to climb into this, into the gob. That was behind the face. We'd find a hole. And the fresh air used to come down the face and detour through there. Really? So we'd get in there to get out the dust. In the gob? In the gob. So you were in danger, really? Yeah. But we'd, we'd used to sit there and rather than gobble all that stuff, you know. There's one thing we haven't talked about. Mm -hmm. Have we got time? Mm -hmm. I was in the mines rescue for nine oh, years. Oh, yes. Ten years. And that was thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyable. So you were still working in the mine, mm. and as a, as a, you were on permanent call out. Yes. As a part of the rescue team. Yeah. Okay, and so really? you're obviously being trained for that. Oh yeah, yeah. I did my training at the uh, down Wentworth Road in Doncaster. It's now a Tesco, yeah. but that used to be the site of the mines rescue station. It was there from the 1920s, and underneath there, there's tunnels. There was a coal face on the really. Way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all the, all the workings it had in the coal mines were all under there. Good God. All under there. And when I walk past and I see the Tesco, I wonder whether the tunnels are still there. Yeah, yeah. Surely they filled them in. I must think about that, about all the mines in the area. Well, all the mines in Doncaster now that are being closed, they're all flooded. Right. They're just flooded. They're underwater. They're just underwater. When they closed Hatfield Pit for two years, a few years ago, the water came halfway up the shaft, God. and the shaft is a thousand meters deep. And the chairs, the ropes are that thick, that's a, that, and there was one rope holding the chair. Yeah. And there used to be 60 men on that chair when it used to go up and down. That was at the bottom of the shaft, in pieces. The rope had snapped and it had gone, a thousand meters. <laughs> and a friend of mine, Robbie Saunders, that was in the man's rescue with me, he was still at Atfield Pit then, on the private enterprise. He went down in a bucket on a rope and they lowered him down to the water and he put the pumps in and they pumped the water out and it took days and days to, to, to get. And when he got, eventually got down into the pit bottom, the chair was all crumpled up in the bottom and the water was still in the tunnels. There was 365 miles of roadways at Atfield Pit. 365 miles. Yeah. A lot of it closed and sealed off. But in total, the surveyors went back on the records and found that we've got th we had 365 miles of tunnels at Atfield Pit alone. So how many millions of miles is there in the country? Did you know Stephen Longley on the Miners' Rescue? Stephen Longley, was it, Dan? Stephen Longley. The quiet guy? Uh, uh, yeah, might He was Miners Rescue. Was he? How recent? Well, it was pretty much. He was your generation. Was he? Steve Longley, where did he live? Did he live on Wentworth Road? In Wheatley? Well, that was near where Mines Rescue was based, wasn't it? Where that it was at the bottom, across from the club, where Tesco is now. Mm. All tunnels underneath there, you know. There's about two miles of tunnels under there. There's a coal face, two ripping lips, and lots of other tunnels. And a big pot village stove, we used to burn tyres on there. And we used to go in with the breathing apparatus on and thick with black acrid smoke. And we used to take the fire service in with us, training. We used to train them. My sister-in-law, she lives literally, do you know, across the road from Tesco? Yeah. Or whatever that is there. Opposite the, the, the yard thing. So I bet there's tunnels underneath there. Probably. Probably. There used to be a pub across from the mines rescue station called the... Was it the Crown? Big place it was. Because we used to come out after a practice at lunchtime and go over for a pint. 
<laughs> as you did. A couple of beers and all. So did you see lots of service in a sense, action? Quite a few fires. fires. I went on um, I went to Loft House. Oh right, yeah, yeah, God, that was big, wasn't it? I was at Loft House when that flooded. Jesus. Um, Don Box, the guy that got killed at Bentley on the paddy. Yeah. Remember me telling about yeah. him, good friend of mine. Yeah. He was the guy that turned around to the HMI and said, because the divers had been in, they couldn't get through. You know, because British yeah. Coal used to have their own divers out in the Lake District. They couldn't get through. And Don Box suggested to the HMI, he said, look. You can photograph them if you want. No. That's on paper. If we test our sets underwater, which we did, we used to inflate the breathing bag, push it under, under in the tank of water and watch for the bubbles. And if there was no bubbles, it was a good set. If there was bubbles coming out, then we put new washers in, tiny back up. So all the joints were all tested for leaks underwater. He said, if we can do that with a set, why can't we wear it underwater? And he went, well, I was going to do that. And Don says, I'll do it. So he tied a rope around his waist. And he went in. The water was in a swilly. A swilly is like a valley. This is a flooded mine, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So you don't know. There's men down there. Yeah, there was four men missing. That's right. There was a straight roadway and then there was a swilly, which was like a dip. And then it came back up to normal level further on. Like a trap, like a trap. Yeah, about 200 metres away. They call it a swilly. And it filled with water. And they couldn't get through. They sent, like I say, they sent the divers in. Couldn't get, the di it couldn't get through because it clogged the filters up on the oh, sets. God. <coughs> because of all the debris in the water. So, Don Box tied a rope round his waist, put his breathing apparatus up, nose clip, mouthpiece, helmet on, <laughs> he even put his helmet on. And he walked in. And he said, when I get to the other end, I'll pull on the rope and my mates can follow. And they were all kitted up ready. And he got through. Really? So that's how they got through the water in the really? beginning, before they got the pumps in. And he did the first recce, him and his team from Bentley, did the first recce of the site. And he came back and he said, it's full, the tunnels are full of breeze blocks and bricks. Right. So the HMI went, so where's that come from? There's no breeze blocks and bricks in by on the call phase. Found out shortly after the incident that a farmer no. had been filling in a hole in his field that kept holding up with rubble out of his farmyard, breeze blocks and bricks. Right. And that was an old shaft that filled with water over the years. And the coal face was getting nearer and nearer to it, oh. unbeknowing it was there. They didn't know it was there. Jeez. And afternoon shift, sorry, day shift, left the machine halfway down the face. Went on. Afternoon shift came on, started the machine up, cut down the face, went into the corner. Oof hit the water and the power of that water blocked off the whole roadway with breeze blocks and bricks and to get in we had to tunnel in the side up over the top. Did you go down? Yeah, to get in and that's how we got in there. How long did that take? Oh, weeks. So you, weeks. you lost the men? Two men, were we, they got two out, two were okay, two still there. So you weren't actually on a mission to save lives because no. you knew what the situation was? Well, we were initially because one of the guys that was in the Loft House Man's Rescue Team, his son was there. He was one of them that was missing. And he vowed, he said he would never go back down the pit if they didn't find his son. But he did go back down the pit. Found him? No. No, his son's still there. Jesus. We were at Flixborough when Flixborough went up, mm -hmm. big chemical works in Lincolnshire, it was below, and um, in North Lincolnshire. We went to that, but we went to find bodies. Mm. The, in those days, there was no rescue service. There was only the fire service. So the firemen had been in, but they'd only got half an hour of oxygen on the back. We got two hours. Right. So they asked us to go in and they gave us some little flags, you know, like the ones you buy at the seaside, putting on your sandcastles. Mm. They gave us some of those white ones, the police. Right. And they said, will you try and identify where the bodies might be? Did you not see them, because they're buried under rubble. But 
you'll see the signs, flies. So where we saw all the flies, we put a fly. Really? And then we came out. And then they recovered them later once the chemicals had been cleared. Because there was a lot of, a lot of chemicals leaking from that site for a long time. We were there in 72, or eight, something like that. It really on. Mm. Might have been 73. And then I went to a fire at Bentley, two fires at Bentley, one at Rosington, fought three fires there. They were big fires. That was during minor strike. Really? <laughs> yeah. During minor strike. And I'd come home from fire, a 12 hour shift on nights. I'd get, get home, have me tea, go to the pub. And there were lads there, you know, on strike, and what have you. They'd look at me and they'd say, You'll be in that pit today, you won't you? I said, How do you know? I said, You need your eyes. I was used to get mascara on. You always, you always knew what pit man, because it mascara. You know, you'd see them in pubs and clubs all over. You knew straight away where the pitman you were talking to because he got mascara on. And uh, I said, yeah, I have, yeah. Where you been? What have you been doing down at Pitman? I said, I've been at Bentley fighting a fire. Oh, I'll let it bloody burn. That's what they used to say. Right. Right. Let it burn. That, were, uh, that was the attitude of most, the majority of the miners during its strike. It is strange that it was feeding and clothing them, and yet they wanted it to. Mm. I find that strange. I find that strange. Even as a workman, I wanted to be a gaffer. Really? I used to love to see a deputy walking out. Really? Yeah, he'd walk in, and he was a special guy. He wore different clothes to rest, and he had different things on him, like his oil lamp and his stick, and his. He'd have a waistcoat. stick. He'd have a waistcoat on. You know, with his watch in his pocket with chain. What, even in your era? Yeah, yeah. They were special guys, you know. These guys were very knowledgeable men. They were, yeah, they were the bee's knees. And I always wanted to be one. A lot of respect for them. I always remember uh, Tommy Chapel. He was at my rescue with little Tommy. <coughs> and he, um, he was a young deputy then. He'd only just become a deputy, I always remember. He died a few years ago, Tommy. Fit man all his life in the mines rescue you had to be the fittest of the fit. Mm. And, the fit yeah. and uh, we used to do the Harvard pack. Have you ever done that? What's that? Oh. Used to put they used to weigh you and then they'd they put a th they'd put you a leather jacket on with pockets in it and they'd put a third of your body weight in lead in this jacket. Oh my god. So you're stripped off to your underpants and your pit boots and a leather jacket with a third of your body weight in it. Jesus. And you'd, you'd have a stool, two foot tall, and a metronome. And they'd set the metronome off to tick, 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 tick. And you'd have to step up and down on that stool for five, no, seven minutes to the metronome. And when you finish, they lay you down on a bench, take your, your jacket off, and take your pulse. Really? And they write it down. Three minutes later, they take pulse again. Write it down. Three minutes after that, pulse again. So we've got three pulse readings over a period of five minutes. Add it together, divide it by three, and that gives you your fitness index. Really? The first time I did it, I only just scraped through. Really? I got 70, which was high. A man of my age at that time was 23, I think. I should have, it should have been well done. And then I found out later why it was so high. Because nobody told me I could use the handles that were on the wall no. to pull myself up. No. I'd done it on me on my own part. Really? So the following year I used the handles and I flew through. Wow. No problem. And then after that they did away with the Harvard pack. We had to go on the treadmill. With no weight on you. They just wired you up with the electrodes. You had the cables over your shoulder, wired up to the computer, and you just walked. And you kept going and 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 then they elevate it and you're going uphill and you just keep going at the same pace wow. to a metronome, of course. It was like that. It was weird, but that's how we did it. And um, and then wire you up. And I always remember the first time I did it, nurse said to me, she says, relax your left leg a bit. I said, why? She says, because it's showing up on this thing. You're using too much of your left leg. I said, I can't because I fall off. 
because they set him up on a, with spirit levels, don't they? Yeah. They've got to be dead level, otherwise you end up. And so they had to stop it. I wish I'd kept my mouth shut. Ah. They stopped it, leveled it up again, and then had to set off again. I always remember nurses saying to us, hey, you could do that forever, you couldn't. And I said, yeah. I could walk all day, non-stop, doing that at that pace. You had to be fit. So how many guys in the Mind and Rescue? Oh, depending on the number of men at the pit, if there were over a thousand men, you had two teams of six. So we had two teams of six at Atfield. Rosington did, because that were a big pit. Smaller pits out Bentley, at Barnsley way on, they probably only had one team. And then you had your regulars at the station. You probably had three teams of men at the station, three full teams plus the superintendent and all the, the rest of the officers, and we used to look up to those guys. These guys were like the SAS, you know. Mm. And they come from all over the country to become officers at uh, Doncaster. <coughs> One guy there from Ashby de la Zeus. Really? Yeah, I always remember him, because his hair were brill creamed. He had big sideburns, and his hair were brill creamed and straight back. Yeah, he was only a little guy like me. Because when I first went into it, you know, we, the set itself weighed 50 pounds. The Proto Mark II weighed 50 pounds. Plus you had to carry stretchers and things like that, you know. And I just think, can I do it? Can I do it? But you do it, you know. I've never been afraid to do anything, me. Really. Never. There's only one thing in life I don't like doing, though. Driving. Really? Yeah, I drive, but I don't like it. Really? Yeah. I don't know why, I just don't like driving. I do it, because you have to, you know, but yeah. I don't like it. Since I've retired, my car's only been out three times in three months. Really? Yeah. Just to put some juice in battery, you know. Yeah, I don't, uh, I walk everywhere. And yeah, walk miles. So how do you fill your time now? Watercolouring? Painting, drawing. Wow, that's lovely, isn't it? Are you going to have an exhibition one day? Oh, when I get a good portfolio together, yeah. yeah, when I think it's good enough, you know, you know what it's like. Yeah. Um, also, I fish. Ah. I've always fished all my life. I wonder what that one is, bits of wax. Sorry. <laughs> it's all right. It's no problem. Um, yeah, I like fishing. I've done it all my life since I was a kid, you see. I used to have an uncle that lived in Ireland, and he used to take me fishing in Ireland when I used to go over. So I've always done that, so I do that. I love it. I love fishing. Um, I'm a, I grow plants as well, I grow flowers. Mm. Auriculas and things like that, I love auriculas. And alpines, they're my two favourites. So yeah, I do that as well. Got greenhouse on the go. Put the heater on every night when it freezes. <laughs> and I read a lot. Oh. And I do a lot of research in lots and lots of things. Yeah, lots of things. That's the university education coming yeah. out, isn't you? I take notes all the time. Really? I'm always taking notes, like I said with you. I've never met you in my life, and um, so what did I do this morning? <laughs> I had a little look, as you do. You're the one. <laughs> You're the stalker. <laughs> so well, what, do you, what do you do with your recordings, then? Well, these are going to be used for the final piece. Oh, are they? So, so scan be... these, all these heads are going to be in the rock. Yeah. Get in there, by the way. Oh, yeah. God, is that me? Yeah. God, it is as well. Oh, my God, you ugly looking. <laughs> Do I look like that? <laughs> it's when you were talking about mining accidents, I got you then. With the frown. Yeah. That frown is synonymous with me. Is it? Yes. People always say to me, why are you frowning? It's for? the intense gaze, not a frown. Yeah, it's, that's, it's not a frown, really. I don't think I've got a frown. It's just occasionally it's intensity when I talk. No, but all the films are going to be used. So we, when you, they'll all be set in the rock, the yeah. heads, and then there'll be a board and there'll be a diagram with all your names, and you'll scan them, and you get this film. So the the, the rock is like a nexus for information, like yeah. social history. Really. Yeah, yeah. And I've got to admit, when I saw that piece of rock, I don't know whether that's going to be the actual piece no. or not. <laughs> But that did look like the stone we used underground, really? you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Apart from 
like I'm talking to you about sandstone. Yeah. When we used to hit sandstone, which was very rare, usually on a fault, it was like that. It looked like that. Really? Yeah. But the normal shale levels above the cold were laid. Oh, they, were in, they were thin layers, thick layers, and you could split them, and they were like billy tables. Wow. You know, when it falls out. Like when the coal separated from the shale, yeah. it was as flat as a billiard table and as shiny as... I was going to say my shoes, but I've got suede on today. But mm. really shiny, yeah. And you'd find little pea mussels dotted about between the layers of coal, between where the coal meets the shale, that's where you've got the pea mussels. You mean uh, fossils? Little tiny fossils, pea mussels like that, brown ones. Really? Yeah, perfect little pea mussels. I used to have loads of them, I'd give them all away. I used to have kept them. <laughs> we used to go fossil hunt, hunting when the pit went on strike. Let's say there were a walkout. Men went on strike, me and my mates would say, come on, we'll go fossil hunting. So we'd go down into Barnsley Bed, which were like a different level, down a one in two drift. And we'd get to the bottom and then we'd find all the fossils. Because that's where the fossils were. There were very few in Aisle, very few. You get the odd pea muscle, that was about it. Loads of fool's gold, you get loads of iron pyrites. Mm. But never in its crystal form. You never found it in crystal form. It was always in layers, thick layers. Mm. And I'd chip it out and take it home, give it to kids. You know, gold from that bit. Yeah. And the problem with fossils underground was you, you got them and they were beautiful. Because as, as the shale broke away from the coal, you got all the leaves, mm. all, all in coal. Wow. So if you went like that, you'd, you'd have all the le leaves in, in pure coal Gosh. set against the mudstone, yeah? Yeah. And then you put it in a bag, take it home, but when the air got to it, oh, it would no. just break up into, just crumble away to nothing, to nothing. Gosh. We used to have trees underground. We had two trees that I know of. Trees? Yeah, two trees. In the... In the uh, side. Um, there was one tree down the JCM, which was a roadway at the back of the pit, where the paddies used to pick up. Um, and it was a trunk that came down like that, and then all the roots went out. Wow. Yeah. And then there was another one down the paddy road that stuck out of the roof. And it was about that thick. Jesus. Yeah. Stone tree? Yeah. And they're still there. Underwater. <laughs> They'll be underwater now. Is that, is that your number? Go, mate. That's yes, brilliant. Get in contact, mate. Yeah, yeah. I will, definitely. Excellent. And we'll have a beer. Excellent. I haven't had a beer for a number of years now. I just stopped drinking. You just stopped fancy it? Yeah. I, just, I was stood in the pub one day, I got a pint and went... Well, I've already. I never ever thought that I'd ever do that with a pint of beer, ever, because I used to love a pint. But yeah, we'll have a beer. Nice one. And we'll meet up in Donny somewhere and we'll yeah. have a chat. I live in Donny anyway, do you still live in Oh, do, I live in um, Thorn now. Oh, right. I used to live in Hatfield, didn't I, remember? Yeah, and yeah. You lived in Bentley, didn't you, at yeah, the time? I picked you up in Bentley, didn't you? I did. That uh, yeah. um, fishing shop. That's right. Yeah, yeah Franco's. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, all them years ago. Right, nice one. See Bring some... Time. Some of your work, so I can, you know, on. I'll bring a sketch for you. Yeah. See you later. Cheers. How are we doing? Uh, you've got five minutes. Do you want me to wrap these for you, Lawrence? I'm just thinking about. Yes, please. I think we've wrapped them all in bubble wrap. Yeah, and then individually. We'll get rid of that water yeah. and put them back in. Yeah. What do you put them in water for? To harden? Keep them hard, cool. Yeah, just just because suspended. of the. Yeah. yeah. Just so you don't lose the detail. Yeah. yeah. I like that bit. The hair. Oh yeah, just put that in. I love that. Give it a hair. What little bit I've got. I've got a photograph of me at home. I wish I'd brought it with me now. A girlfriend took it with me when I was at university. And I didn't know she'd take me because she took it on a telephoto lens. I was at the other side of the quad. And she took this photograph. And it's a bit grainy, but I tell you what, it's a brilliant photo. Because it's me. It sums you up. It's me, yeah. Yeah, it does. Every time I look at it, I think that's me, that. But I had a bit of a beard then. Oh, right. You know, a shorter one than yours, but... Yeah. 
I was just saying to Mickey then, I said, when, when he said about it, he took you down the pit. So that, I couldn't believe that. I just started laughing. It was like totally some of that Mickey would end up in. He went, yeah, he said, uh, I said, I didn't work there. <laughs> he didn't work there. We were going and he said, get on the belt, he says, keep your head down. And you have to jump when I say jump. So we'll go through the roll and it'll come back up. Mickey said, oh, terrified. <laughs> it, was a, it was the North, the Northwest Man Rider. Yeah. You dive on the bottom belt to go in and the top belt come out. Is, is that how everyone gets in? That's how they used to get into the northwest. Yeah, the other the other parts of the pit they used to get in by the paddy. Because you hear that certain ones who say it's not a man riding belt. Is that what they mean? Yeah. It's... Yeah, they had to be specially set up with cow catchers and things like that. You know, in case you went through past the lighting station and you'd end up in a bunker somewhere. You know, so they had a a swingy thing that went over that when you hit it, it stopped the belt. And it all had to be lit and pr proper platforms and signage and all that kind of stuff. Amazing. 12 minutes used to take. Really? 12 minutes. Did they go quite fast or? Yeah, yeah, probably travelling to about six miles an hour. It's quite, quite a pace, really, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, six, seven miles an hour. And the, the belt was about 3,000 metres. 3,000 metres in length. Big belt. It was a cable belt. It was it used to carry, well, probably, I don't know, probably about 200 tonnes full length. Because when it stopped fully laden with coal, it used to take forever to, to start up again. You know, you'd hear, the, you'd hear all the motors picking, and then you'd hear all the gearboxes coming in, you know. and Massive. I took him down to see Gearhead on, the, on that Man Rider belt. I said, come and have a look at this. He'd never seen anything like it. Big motors, massive motors, big gearboxes. And then I took him, the men were working that morning as well, on the coal face, which was, it was uh, unusual to cook coal on a weekend, but they were. So I took him into the tailgate, walked down the tailgate, throat face, yeah. I, I, I can't, even after what, a year and a bit of doing this, I, I still can't fully comprehend what it would have been like, God knows how many, Hundreds and hundreds of metres underground. A thousand metres at... The um, sound of the earth think. cracking around you. And Didn't crack. It used to bang really loudly. Oh, that, that's bad. <laughs> Didn't crack, it used to bang. Yeah. It used to go... It, it, like, it was like a gunshot going off, uh, but louder. You know, like a cannon. Well, Mickey said it. A bit like a cannon. No, it used to be charging explosives. I was, yeah. I used to carry 100 debts with me, 100 detonators on my belt. And I used to fire all the time, every day I used to fire coal out in rock. Are you and your hair now all the way around? <laughs> <laughs> Not much, have I? So how many staff have you got now then? In the art department? Well, as many as we used to, man. That's no. for sure. How many have you got? About four, five. Yeah, that's right. So there's Mickey, Andrea, probably remember Andrea. Andrea Sutton. Yes, I do. Um Mickey, Andrea, Paula, Pam, Lynn, me, Liz, Joe, David. Eight. That's not bad then, is it? So Graham's gone. Do you remember Rob Ward? Yeah. Remember? Yeah. He's gone. Well, I'd have thought Rob Ward had gone before Graham, or did they go? He did, yeah. Just, yeah. Just before. They, I actually, yeah. Uh, they were. Uh, they were always in the printing department. Yeah. Them. But Graham was the guy. I always used to get Graham as a tutor in in printing. Yeah. I didn't have Rob. Yeah. Some reason. Well, Rob used to be more um, etching and lith printing, German right. stone and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but also Rob, in terms of our history, art theory and stuff. Do they still do stone lith though? Yeah. Well, there's a skill here anymore. Can you remember Jerry Lee? Yeah. He's he went this year. Did he? Yeah. Jerry was a brilliant guy. Yeah. He was the only guy I knew that could do the trick with the matchbox. Nobody else could do it. I taught them all a trick when we went on a field trip. To Boggle Hall. 
to boggle all. <laughs> and it was at night, we'd all had a few beers. We got back to the place we were staying at, and uh, someone brought beers back with them, you know. That's my phone. Do you mind? <laughs> no, I'll leave it, it's all right, it'll not be urgent. It'll be all right. Um, yeah, and um, I said, I bet you can't do this. So I put this matchbox, you know, the, what you do, you kneel down, you put your elbow there and you put your hand there and where your hand finishes, put the matchbox, then you, where your knee is on the floor, put your hands behind your back, and then you've got to lean forward and pick it up with your teeth. Now you've got to have a very flexible um, middle section and women can do it easily because they've got more flexibility in that part of the body. Women did it dead easy. Not that young lads could do it, I couldn't do it. Jerry went, I'll have a go, straight down. He was the only guy that could do it out of all of us. That didn't surprise me really. <laughs> he was all right. When you got it, we're finished. Have you? We're finished. For a brown. Hello. I'm at the college at the moment. I'm having my head sculpted. <laughs> yeah. You should have done it, Brad. I've your head sculpted here at the college. It's what mining memorial. You know that mining memorial thing I told you about in summer? It's about that. So uh, I've got a phone call and I'm, I've come along and I've been sat here for a couple of hours. And I, and I can see myself moulded in wax now, and it looks scary. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you then, Brian? Are you at home? Done. Do you want to photograph this one? Yeah. 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 Do a reveal to the yeah. camera. It's going to ask you. This camera. Oh, I'll do. <coughs> well, I'll tell you what I'll do. As soon as I get home, I'll get about a little bit. Too. Yeah, I'll do that when I get home, Brian. Be about, be about All right, see you later. Bye. That, believe me or not, was a guy that worked with me <coughs> for 20 years after the city. We'll tell him on the next photo shoot we want to photograph him. <laughs> I just told him. I said you should have done it last July, right? We can, we're still photographing. Will you? Yeah. I'll ask him, see what he says. As many people as possible. Plus, Brian, big lad, he won't want him at pitch. He's 67 now, so he's lost a lot like I have. I've lost all my muscle, all my muscle's gone now. And Brian same, but he was a big fella. He used to, we used to eat baths <laughs> after we'd been down pit. And he'd, he'd come round to my cubicle and he'd get a, he'd get a big car sponge like that. And he'd say, right, wash me back. He'd chuck it at me. And I'd have to wash his back and he were covered in air. He was like a gorilla. He was completely covered and I couldn't know, I didn't know where I'd been. <laughs> I the same colour, you know. And yeah, brilliant. Brilliant guy. Yeah. And I used to, you know, to stop talking. And frown. Oh no, <laughs> I didn't frown. <laughs> it's there, it's there with frown. Is it? Have you got it? Sadly, he was talking very seriously at one point. <laughs> yeah, and um, that's Phil. Yeah. Can I take a photograph? Yeah, you're not allowed to. Yeah, you're not. Oh. Just sort of keys. Yeah, well, you're going to get a plaster. <laughs>